Hello everyone. Welcome to UT Telecom's webinar series. Today we have Mr. Ryan Pereira, who is uh, Vice President and General Manager at Siena, and joining him is uh, Gautam Bela, the Senior Director Engineering at Siena. So the topic of today's webinar is the telco cloud and the trends and the emergence of networking 3.0 in the Indian co context. We all know that businesses and organizations are trying to adapt to the, to the new normal. The digital transformation is happening across sector and I, we are going to see the acceleration also. And in order to cater uh, the new demands of distributed and cloud computing, there is a rising interplay between telcos and web, scaler, web scalers. So I think to uh, to further discuss and to, to further shed light on the topic, I am going to hand it over to you, Ryan and Gotham. You guys can take it forward and then just start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Danish. Uh, welcome to Networking 3.0. Um, perhaps a, a good starting point would be to go back and look at the network journey and uh, and, and see uh, how this progress and what was networking 1.0 uh, and, uh, and 2.0. Okay, um, if you look back the last perhaps a couple of decades, uh, there were three distinct um, eras and each era was actually defined by a killer app. Let's take a look at that. Networking 1.0. You know, this was this lasted till about late 1990s. The main driver during this period was connecting people and places. And of course, there were a finite number of people and places. And um, when you look at the networking side of things, it was mainly around scaling up. Vendors tried to build uh, ever big uh, switches. Uh, they were, of course, uh, you know, custom design with custom hardware and software, even with custom ASICs. And some of us have been through this era. We moved from circuit switching to cell switching and later on to label switching. Another uh, interesting uh, feature in this period was uh, the strict compliance to the OSI 7 layer. You know, the layers were considered opaque. And partly because you know we had limited CPU capabilities at that time. Again, given we were dealing with a fewer number of nodes and so on, and the network could be uh, could be operated by humans. It was network was largely human operated. Then, in perhaps in in early to a uh, very early uh, late two thousand late nineties to early two thousands a new inflection happened that was public internet right and of course started with uh, netscape then there was google search and the the multimedia uh, applications like uh, uh, youtube and facebook came in and because this was data led you know we almost saw uncontrollable growth in data in this networking 2.0 era and from the networking standpoint, we were seeing a clear uh, shift in some of the focuses. Of course, this era belongs to the web scalers. They mastered the art of scaling and of course started off with data centers. Instead of trying to focus on switches, like you know, trying to make bigger and bigger switches, they actually took this concept of fabric, the spine leaf architectures. You're gonna hear more about these things from uh, Gautam shortly. And because they were building fabrics, of course, initially inside data centers, now they are going outside the data center. Um, there were so many nodes. Um, the industry started taking a network level resiliency approach as opposed to node level resiliency. We also saw a huge acceptance of merchant silicon as opposed to um, custom ASICs. This is the time again, uh, the vendors were under pressure and there was lots of hype around uh, SDN NFE. There was pressure to actually disaggregate hardware from software. Under this pressure, there were early attempts by vendors to extract their software and run those VNFs on uh, virtual machines. 
initially these things were not that uh, effective, but later on there's lots of improvements happening right now. And uh, again, getting into mid 2000 time frame, uh, networks were becoming a lot bigger, and it was clearly cannot could not be uh, operated by humans. The automation started uh, coming into place. Still a journey, but it uh, it's more and more automation started happening, particularly inside data centers and in the telco front. Some of the new uh, new deployments, and everything was fine and chugging along. Then the third inflection started happening. We believe we are at the very beginning, perhaps in third inflection, networking 3.0. Now this era, of course, could last for several decades. It is actually characterized by cloud, a cloud which is heavily application-led. For the businesses and enterprises, they are lifeline is applications and application performance. Because it's so critical for the business, the enterprises now have accepted or are quite comfortable to outsource the infrastructure out to the public cloud. So in this era, what are the key things that's, that we're beginning to see? The biggest thing is, of course, the hybrid multi-cloud migration. In this, in this context, uh, particularly when it comes to wide area network, SD-WAN has become the choice for enterprises. It continues to evolve, it continues to improve, and it's been accepted by enterprises across the world. Why? Because SD-WAN can, be, um, can be very tightly coupled to flows and tightly coupled to workloads and, and, and pods. Again, uh, the industry is now building more grounds up network functions, the, 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 the cloud native functions, uh, based on containers. Uh, there's, there's improvements happening on that front. Another area that we're seeing is uh, the standardized APIs and data models. Particularly if multiple of these things have to work together, standardized APIs and data models are gonna be quite critical. Uh, we're seeing more and more improvements and adaption on AIML and closed loop. And, and given we are now running applications both on-prem and uh, multiple clouds and, and the proliferation of uh, uh, IoT network can, can, cannot be managed by humans. Uh, in fact, more than automation, it, is, it, is, it has started the path towards being self-driven. Again, uh, quite, a few, uh, quite a few phases to go through before we can achieve that. So this is a very high level outline on how the network journey has taken place over the last say, three decades. Um, before I move on, let, let's also look at what was happening from a standard standpoint. In networking 1.2 and 2.0, um, you know, we would, we would highly depend on the likes of ITUs, IEEEs, and IETFs for standardization. In fact, let me give you a data point. By end of 2010, IETF has over 7,000 RFCs. And you would think that's progress. In fact, when you really analyze, those 7,000 RFCs were actually introduced by a handful of vendors. So it's been argued that perhaps those were done to increase the barrier to entry. But that has all changed now. Now we have a quite a number of open community uh, open source uh, bodies that are, those are now um, making a huge impact in uh, defining the reference models. The, 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 of course, the power is be beginning to shift towards the end users and operators. Of course, one little downside of all of these uh, community open source uh, bodies are they, they're mushrooming and, and very hard to uh, keep, uh, keep track of some of these things. But again, three bodies to um, watch out for would be, of course, ORAN, Open uh, Compute Project, and uh, CNCF. So in this backdrop, in this backdrop, let's take a closer look at India, the Indian sector, Indian IT and telecom sector. Wireless, we have over 667 million wireless broadband. The, the download, uh, monthly download levels are pretty high, but the actual download uh, rates are still 
uh, only 12 megabits per second and, and the global average is over 30, 35. And, um, but if you look at the last say 10, 15 years, the Indian operators haven't really been able to deliver any meaningful uh, return on capital invested in this segment. In fact, the average return on capital invested on the wireless broadband side is low single digit. So something has to happen, something has to change. Now it's broadly accepted, not just by the Indian operators, but by the operators around the world, particularly uh, as we are very close to getting into 5G, one of the things that the operators could do is reduce the cost. We all know 70% of the cost is on the RAN and bulk of that is on baseband. Uh, so there's a lot of focus on baseband. One of the best ways to do is by virtualizing baseband, either virtualizing both DU and CU or just virtualizing CU. This gives so much benefit uh, cost savings in terms of having to um, having to use less number of uh, baseband units and also being able to do your uh, spectral efficiency management a lot, lot, lot better. So that's, that's from the wireless broadband standpoint. On the residential standpoint, we have 250 million homes, hardly 19 million have uh, broadband. So there's a significant amount of Net, uh, like an infrastructure build has to happen. There's focus right now on building FTTX. We believe this segment will also be uh, complemented by perhaps fixed 5G, uh, fixed wireless access. In this segment, again, we're dealing with a very cost sensitive customer base. Uh, we believe by centralizing residential gateways and access functions, um, you can produce a lot, lot, uh, lot more cost effective end user devices. And then finally, on the enterprise front, you know, we know we got 60 million SMBs. You know, more than one third of India's employment is generated by this SMB. This is again a, a massive segment, somewhat underserved. Uh, and uh, here also, you need, of course, not just connectivity, but also uh, some of the new solutions. Like I mentioned earlier on, um, things like cloud-hosted SD WAN. Uh, and functions like that are going to play a critical role. Again, when it comes to large enterprises, uh, more than 80% of the workloads, their workloads still sit on prem. So, so much more improvements to be done. So, what's common across these three sectors wireless broadband, residential, and enterprise going forward? What's common in our mind is the importance of bringing computing closer. All of these functions that I talked about, whether it is baseband pooling or uh, residential gateway functions being virtualized or SD-WAN, they all need uh, to be computed a little bit closer to these end users. So in order to complete the picture, this is how we think uh, India uh, Indian telecom and IT sector could look like in, in networking 3.0. They come in and then you see all of these functions in the form of, um, you know, uh, microservices containers running on uh, COT servers. And, and in India, from an India context, we believe what's going to justify edge is not some um, gaming AR VR cases. We believe what's going to justify India's edge is mainly network function and app performance. Uh, secondly, is this also going to enable uh, multi-hybrid cloud migration? And a third very India-centric thing would be being able to offload workloads into the edge. By doing that, you can make the end user devices a lot less expensive and it could last longer. Again, Edge cannot uh, work on its own. Edge will be working in very close conjunction with the core. This is where the bigger heavy workloads are going to take place. Of course, this will be tightly, tightly coupled. Now, for all of these things to happen, you need an underlay. We call it connect underlay. And we need a connectivity underlay that is um, uh, 
highly scalable, programmable, that can actually take instructions from these um, network functions and workloads on top. So you're going to hear a lot more about that, a lot, lot more about this thing from Gautam shortly. So in a nutshell, this is at a very high level. This is how we visualize uh, how India Indian telecom sector could look like in in the networking 3.0 backdrop. Now, before I hand over to Gautam, I also want to outline. Now, this architecture is not without risks. If you look at the genesis of cloud computing, you know they mastered the art of centralized um, cost efficiencies and economies of scale. When you start doing edge, when you start distributing computing, it actually has a risk of um, the resources being uh, resources being um, stranded. Uh, so, so that's we believe one of the biggest hurdles for uh, edge. But let's let's take a quick look at that. What I mean by, by that? If you if you take a closer look at the cloud competing cloud computing environment, we know cloud computing is pivoted on three things: compute, storage, and connect. Let's see how these three how how these three things sort of evolved over the last say ten years. Compute, right? Over the last eight years, compute only doubled in throughput. It no longer uh, uh, can keep up with the Moore's law. Of course, industry is trying to do various acceleration things like smart NICs to uh, take care of this problem. Storage, on the other hand, done much better, six times better than compute, but still it's it's beginning to hit the hit the ceiling. And once you map connect. This is actually the best performing out of the lot. It improved 20 times. We went from like 40 gig, now we ship 800 gig. So this is the this is the third pillar we believe that can actually come to the rescue here. Particularly being able to keep up with this uh, demand uh, demand in cloud computing. So again, like I said earlier on, when the compute start getting distributed. Uh, it is the it is connect that has that promise to being able to to being able to deliver this uh, fungible pools of cloud computing. Again, you're going to hear more about uh, this thing from uh, Gautam shortly. And um, in Intelligent Connect, we believe there are three major attributes. Intelligent Connect needs to be able to deliver on intent-driven networking. Um, and it needs to be able to scale at network level, not so much at node level, and being able to provide, and uh, being able to deliver predictive latency. So with that, um, really to drill down into the connect side of things, both in the access and the core side, um, I like to hand over to my colleague Gautam Villa. Thanks, Ryan. Second, let me just share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? No, sir. Yeah, we yeah. can see. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. So with that, uh, let me just continue from where what Ryan uh, already mentioned. So what I'll do, what I'm going to do here in the next uh, 25, 20, 25 minutes is uh, do a bit of a double click on uh, and pick on two key trends that actually Ryan actually talked about, and do a bit of a double click on uh, the cloud platforms and uh, the connect platform. So let's start off with uh, the, the cloud platform. The two key trends are that one is the cloud uh, needs to get distributed. And the second one is how do we enable the underlying connect platform to allow us to actually uh, distribute this cloud over the van, right? So those are the two key important ones. Let's start off with the cloud uh, platform. And to do that, let's look at uh, 
a core data center and let's talk about what are the efficiencies that got driven into the core data center piece now there are a lot of case studies which say, which say that these architectures have been extremely efficient efficient and extremely uh, uh, helpful in terms of the scaling that they've achieved in the last uh, decade or so so there is a set of distributed applications if we start looking at a hyperscale data center there's a set of distributed applications and physically they reside on uh, thousands of uh, thousands and thousands of uh, racks of uh, compute and storage now there's also this uh, networking aspect inside the data center which is typically driven over what Ryan called as fabrics driven by the least spine architecture now if we look at the networking inside the data center it has some key characteristics right and those are that these networks are infinitely scalable because of the architectures that they're built on and secondly they prove to be extremely predictable and the reason i say they are predictable is uh, they are in a very constrained kind of an environment and the way they are designed is i can actually get from any server to any server in a set of two or four hops or maybe six hops depending upon how many levels of hierarchy that is being built into the least spine so the, these networks are fairly in, uh, in scalable as well as predictable now what we need to do going further is if we need to extend this data out into the van right uh, we need to create let's say regional data centers and we need to create edge compute we also need to be able to deliver a ubiquitous app and user experience with with this distributed cloud and that's where the underlying connect platform comes into the picture so what this connect platform will look like and what it needs to really do is it needs to start emulating these behaviors of predictability and infinite scale now it's one thing to build these kind of network inside a hyperscale data center and there are a lot more challenges when we actually start to scale this out into the van right so what we're going to do is we are going to talk about those few challenges and how we actually start to emulate the underlying network 3.0 from from that perspective the other important piece on the connect platform is that it not only connects these uh, cloud and content together it has to actually create the on ramp for the consumers and for the businesses and residential uh, gateways that Ryan talked about. So access densification is one of the most important pieces here that needs to enable creation of these on ramps into and connect these users into the cloud. So that that's also another topic that we're going to talk about as we go along. So let's dive in. So let's look at some of the key aspects if I want to really or if we want to really build next gen connect platforms in India. Uh, as Ryan already talked about, there are six, uh, 667 uh, million broadband users in India. We have one of the uh, we have one of the cheapest data rates uh, in in the world, and we have one of the highest data usage. Uh, it's about 11 to 13 GB per user per month. Now, if I if we start putting these three parameters together, what we've seen is from let's say 2015 to 2020, we've seen about a 45 times increase in data traffic. And with very conservative estimates, uh, this data traffic is going to grow by another 20 times in the next five years. Very conservative estimates. It, this could be much more uh, if we start to uh, plot the graph on how, how data traffic has grown. What this really means is the connect platform needs to be extremely scalable. So scale is definitely one aspect that we're looking at. Now, if I look at the business side of things, uh, if I look at the mobility business and I compare a few different countries, right? Uh, US, China, Japan, uh, Brazil, India. Uh, and I start to look at the subscriber base part of it. Uh, we are actually one of the highest subscriber base right after China. And if I also look at the ARPUs, we are one of the lowest ARPUs in the world. Now, when I multiply these two, what it means is I need to be able to serve this very high subscriber base with a very low revenue right so overall market size in india is fairly low compared to the others and that's the reason these networks need to be a lot more cost effective it puts a lot of pressure on the connect platform and it needs to be built in a lot more cost effective way the third thing is the reliability if i look at uh, fiber conditions in india we see roughly about 15 fiber cuts per month per thousand kilometers and these are pretty much the long distance networks that we see uh, for for many years now if i compare this to uh, let's say western europe or australia or us the average is about 0.75 fiber cuts per month per 1000 kilometers what that really means is if i have to build let's say a 1000 kilometer service from mumbai to bangalore 
uh, that's about 1000 kilometers i get about 91 point if you do the math you get about 91.6 percent availability whereas if i have to reach about four lines of availability uh, we need to build about 3.2 resources and when i say resources it's a number of uh, alternate paths that we need to build uh, on over this thousand kilometers compared to a 1.6 that i that we would need to build in other parts of the world so if we look at this right we not only need to build a uh, scalable networks which are more cost effective we also need to use double the number of resources to build this network so is there a innovative solution to actually cut down these resources into half and still be able to build reliable networks so that's what we're going to look at in the subsequent charts the last piece is the automation and automation is by no means an afterthought uh, these days right we, we start thinking about automation right from the uh, day we start planning uh, new networks so a couple of things uh, again our automation works on three things it's uh, sense uh, it's analyze and act so the underlying infrastructure needs to be programmable uh, we need to have live telemetry and we need to be able to analyze uh, data from that telemetry and be able to actually uh, make changes onto the connect platform as we go along so that's so those are the four important pillars on which we uh, start to architect next gen connect platforms and let's get into a little more detail on what would be required to actually uh, build one. So let's start looking at the economics and performance of high scale long distance networks in India. So if I look at uh, what could be the total traffic that could actually come into a site or a major, major metro city, uh, and I map it over the last few years, right? What we've been doing is we've been building uh, monolithic fabrics and we've been doubling the size of the fabrics every couple of years to cater to the growing traffic but what's going to happen is very soon the traffic is going to outgrow the fabric the fabric size that we can create so we need to get a little more innovative here and look at something apart from the electrical fabrics which are also fairly costly to build so again going further let's look at the economics of what goes into building uh, let's say a 2000 kilometer network now if there is a source and a destination and i need to be able to uh, go from a source to destination uh, I have to actually go through some layers right which is uh, let's say the OSI stack I go through a layer 3 a DXC a modem and, a, and the photonic layer what we've done here is we've tried to uh, analyze uh, which what is the cost to actually uh, pass through a transit location uh, by getting into each of these layers so what we've done here is if if we start uh, from the source if, I, if we start to get, let's say take a 4g channel from a source and we uh, go about 500 kilometers if i have to go into transit location one and just pass through the photonic layer uh, the cost of doing that would be approximately 1x and the moment i get into the electrical layer for a region function or a dxc function or a router function uh, the cost actually goes into 75x 80x and 85x so the point that i'm trying to make here is there is a cost line which we call as the 75x cost line right and if we can actually keep most of the functions below this cost line uh, we are able to build much more efficient network networks at a much lower cost and that's what we're going to try to do uh, go for going forward so there are some key design aspects that we need to look at to be able to do that the first design aspect is that uh, stay at the lowest layer in transit right which means that if i don't need to actually go up the stack uh, don't go up the stack unless it is absolutely required so what is the thing what are the constraints that actually push me to go above this cost line the first one is OSNR constraint which means uh, the performance of this optical modem should be good enough and it should allow it should allow me to actually transit to all the sites being below the cost line the, the second function is the resiliency and the steering capability which is required so if i need a steering capability uh, normally we would go up the stack and get that steering capability so again the key point here is that the higher we go up into the stack the more the cost uh, in terms of both capex and opex so with that in mind let's see how actually uh, some some of these factors can help so let's look at the performance of the optical modem and if i if we have to build a, let's say a service from mumbai to delhi about 1600 kilometers we have the option of building it with modem a or modem b modem a costs about 60 and modem b costs about 100 bucks so just by looking at the modems it could be an easy choice to go with modem a but if i look at an end-to-end -end performance of that modem and if i compare the overall cost 
uh, it's very clear that modem B is able to drive the signal directly versus a uh, modem A it has to reach in every 400 kilometers, which means that the performance of the modem drives uh, the cost of the network. And this this is a fairly important point as we go along. So that's the reason the industry has been driving to better and better modems. Now, if we look at it from a small uh, circuit perspective, let's say I have to go only about 150 kilometers from Mumbai to Pune. Uh, the same modem can actually uh, now change the uh, higher performance into higher capacity and it could still match the cost of a lower performing modem. So again, the point that I'm trying to make here is adaptive modulation on modems actually drives optimized utilization. So apart from the modems, let's look at some other stuff. Let's look at uh, creating an infinite programmable fabric. Now we talked about uh, fabrics and fabric is one of the most important parameter and we need to continue to grow the amount of fabric that we need per site if we have to actually make more efficient networks. So if I have to create a infinite fabric, what do I start with? We have to start with uh, taking some constraints here. Let's start with a particular fiber strand, right? And give or take uh, with the technology that we have today, we can put about 25 tera of throughput into a fiber. If I consider both C and L band, we, we should be able to put about 50 terabit into a fiber. And with this constraint that we have on the fibers, if there is a site which has, let's say, six fibers coming into it, uh, what we need, what what the site can actually jointly get is about 300 tera of uh, uh, capacity in terms of bandwidth. Now, the traditional way of doing things is take all that 300 uh, uh, tera of fabric uh, of capacity that is entering into that site, take it above the 75x cost line that we talked about, and create a large 300 tera fabric. Right. So this is a traditional way of doing things. And the functions that we typically do inside a fabric is we do a add drop function at that site, we do a region function, we do a steering function, and we could do a transit function. So there is a lot of traffic which needs to transit through the sites without getting anything, without getting into the add drop mode at all. So we've analyzed a lot of networks, and what we see is uh, if we analyze some key sites in the center of the country, almost 80% of this traffic is just transiting site. It's not even it's not even getting processed or it doesn't even need to drop at that site. So how can we optimize uh, this uh, this situation right now? So let's look at the same situation wherein I have created an optical transit function using Rodem capabilities to actually, uh, let's say, put the 50% of the traffic below the 75x, 75x cost line. What has happened here is I have reduced the size of my electrical fabric from 300 tera to 150 tera, which is all, which is half the capacity. And the remaining transit functions is actually seamlessly being done below this cost line. And the cost of doing that is uh, 1x as we as we actually talked about in the earlier slides. So this is one thing that we can do. Now, what is the other thing that we can actually attack if we have to further optimize uh, this design? So let's go a step further. And let's look at what I can create. What I can create here is a programmable uh, control plane function, which allows me to steer traffic away uh, in one direction or the other in a more intelligent uh, fashion, right? Which means what I've done is I've taken away now the transit function and the steering function out of this uh, electrical fabric, and I pushed it down below, below the 75x cost line. What that really does is that leaves the region function and the addrop function. Now the addrop function is something that I need to drop on the site. So I obviously need to have that traffic here and I obviously need to have that fabric size. The region function can further be optimized by using uh, better modems as we saw in the previous slide. So if we start putting all this together, uh, there is a lot more efficiency that we can drive into networking 3.0. So moving on to the next one, uh, let's see how this fabric actually works. We, we, we talked about uh, optical modem performance. We talked about creating an infinite fabric. Now let's see how this fabric actually works in an actual network. And what are the differences between this and a traditional fabric? So if you look at the diagram on the left side, and it makes a lot of sense to put it this way to, to explain this. If you look at the diagram on the left side, uh, this is the way traditional networks were built. We had a fabric right in the center and we had all the resources around it, right? So if there is, a, if the site has four directions and there are this traffic coming from each of these directions, the traffic, all the traffic has to hit the resource first. It has to then go to a fabric and then travel from one resource to the other. 
what we are doing on the right side is we are actually creating this green fabric which is called an infinite fabric and the reason i call it infinite is i have created very close to the fiber right so it can actually read out any traffic which comes from any of these fibers uh, through the entire cnl band and actually read out it to any of the fibers without touching too many resources on the inside what we've done is we put resources as a central pool right in the center now let's get into the next step of how this actually works and how this performs under uh, let's say fiber failure scenarios right if i have to send let's say 20 cross 400 gig traffic coming in from the uh, west side going into the east side and i have to do that in both these networks so everything works well what i have to really do is i have to create uh, 20 resources here 20 resources here and we are good to go in this case what i've done is i've created those 40 resources in the center and this actually uses the 20 20 20 resources and it sends the traffic out the other end now let's see what happens if uh, there is a failure in one of the in one of the directions whether when this cut happens on the left side i need to be able to have 20 other resources which were sitting idle to be able to actually reroute this traffic into another direction which is towards the, towards the south now and take another path to the end destination what happens on the right side is actually these same 20 resources actually comes in from here and read it is able to steer the traffic into a different direction which means i don't need any other uh, additional resources same happens when i get into a second cut scenario or a second failure scenario we need to be able to have another 20 resources on the left side which are able to read out and steer the traffic and on the right side with the same available resources we are able to steer the traffic through the outer fabric and the same 40 resources are used so what's happening here is in a two cut scenario we actually used 80 modems or 80 resources on the left side 40 out of which were active at any given point in time and we were able to actually use those 40 resources and uh, utilize them in a full uh, full uh, way on the right side and without any additional resources we were able to scatter to these cut scenarios so that's what i was talking about uh, building the reliability and the resiliency into networks when we actually uh, get into this infinite fabric without building any further resources if, so within the same resources we can take care of the reliability and that's a very important point when we build networks in india so we looked at we looked at the core part of the networking and uh, if we look at if we just go to the access side of networking we talked about uh, the consumer resources uh, to start with uh, and building the on-ramps for the consumer to actually connect uh, to the cloud networking function so let's look at what happens on the access side of things there was a 3g era in 2014 where we used to get about 14 mbps from uh, from a tower and we used to put one gig and five gig boxes in the access and aggregation and we used to kind of build this uh, backhaul network come 2016 4g came in and we started getting about 100 mbps per tower started putting bigger boxes fabrics uh, maybe 10 gig and 60 gig in the access and aggregation and we started serving this traffic 4g actually 4g advance came in uh, the throughput actually changed from 100 mbps to 300 mbps uh, with some more spectrum uh, and uh, more capabilities on the wireless side of things uh, we built for the bigger fabrics 30 gig and 200 gig and we started serving this the point that i'm trying to make is every time there's a change in the g on the wireless side of things uh, we need to build these overlay networks and the point is can we actually avoid building these overlay and create a neg uh, or a g agnostic network so what we're trying to do in 5g again the same thing is going to happen uh, instead of 300 mbps we're going to get about 1500 mbps uh, per tower uh, and we're going to see some front haul mid haul and back haul capabilities which are going to get created once uh, 5g hits what we are trying to do now is uh, once we get into these 300 gig kind of capabilities uh, the coherent plugs actually start to hit the access uh, side of things which means that we could actually create an underlying edge line system and take care of certain of the take care of these capabilities like we did in the uh, uh, optical networks that we talk about uh, to create a virtual a least fine or virtual hub and spoke architecture here and once we do that we can actually seamlessly scale this network without actually changing the boxes way, uh, anytime soon so that's how we start to create energy networks if i just double click on what the capability on this x hall side is which means uh, the front hall back hall and mid hall that we talked about 
Uh, what we see here is on the top, uh, there is a 4G E node B. And if I look at the coverage area, it's fairly large coverage area on the 4G side. Uh, once the G node B hits in from a 5G perspective, uh, this is about uh, 100 megahertz of spectrum or 200 megahertz of spectrum that we take. And the coverage is much lower, which means that if or to cover the same area, we'll have to put in a lot more radio heads. And this is where uh, the capability of putting the radio heads comes in and driving them back to the same uh, baseband pooling that Ryan was talking about. So we create some front hall capability. Protocols like ORAN start to uh, become more important. Uh, things like CIPRI and eCIPRI uh, start to become more important. So we have a front hall function at, at, at this site. We have already an existing backhaul function which is coming in from the 4G. And then we have a mid-haul function because for this particular G node B, uh, we have created uh, a virtual CU and a virtual DU. What I mean to say here is, or what the point that I'm trying to make here is, at the same uh, site that we have, we are going to have multiple capabilities inside uh, this, uh, uh, this box, which means it needs to be an X-Hall box. And underlying that X-Hall, we need to be able to create an edge-line system that drives much higher capacity out of this X hall. So we believe that this is the way that networks are going to evolve on the access side of things. Again, there's going to be a lot more connect on the enterprise and home uh, residential section, which we've not shown here, but the same uh, box is actually able to cater to the residential and the home in the form of uh, FTTX and backhaul capabilities. So there are multiple, again, this being access, uh, there are multiple solutions that we can actually work with here. Uh, there are pure passive solutions that people have tried. There are traditional backhaul solutions. There is backhaul plus mid-haul. And there is the overall X-Hall solution. Again, there's no one-size-fits-all here, but it will depend on the situation and the capability of, to adapt to a different solution uh, as and when required. The common criteria here being uh, what we could do is we could create an edge line system and underline which could actually uh, allow us to actually increase the capabilities of these systems and not change them every two years. So that's the important piece that comes into picture in, in, in this aspect. So just to conclude, uh, we, we talked about, uh, Ryan, Ryan talked about the uh, cloud, how the edge is gonna get created and how the backhaul and edge and the access networks are gonna create, uh, get created. Uh, just to summarize, we talked about economics of uh, uh, high-scale long-distance networking. We talked about modem how modem optical modem performance is extremely critical. We talked about creating an infinite fabric and driving it below the 75x cost line. And we talked about uh, building resiliency with this uh, with this uh, uh, programmable fabric. On the access side, we talked about uh, creating uh, energy 5G access networks or any energy networks which are agnostic to a G and they keep going, which are much more scalable. And we talked about uh, the XOR designs. Again, the last thing that I would like to point out here is, or as I said earlier as well, automation is not an afterthought. Uh, we need to think about automation as the base of all these new architectures. And it's, it's a very significant part of uh, everything that we do and plan. So with that, I uh, I'll open, it up, open it up for questions. Uh, Danish, back to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gautam. Uh, we already have uh, questions coming in from uh, our, our viewers. So first question has come and it uh, talks about, uh, uh, like it, uh, the person has asked, like, could you elaborate on why baseband pooling will play an important role going forward? I think uh, Ryan uh, uh, talked about the baseband pooling. If Ryan could take that uh, question up. Sure. Um... Hope you can hear me okay. The voice is fine. Okay. Um, look, if you if you look at India, right, we we have about uh, over two million uh, BTSs in the country. It spreads across, I believe, little less than six hundred thousand towers. And and this is a very expensive resource, and and not all baseband get utilized equally all the time. So. Um, particularly given the economic situation, you, you cannot repeat the same thing and expect a different result when it comes to 5G. So by by having few of them, a few of them centralized and virtualized, you can you can use this resource much more efficiently. Um, and by running them on top of uh, cost servers, you can further reduce the cost. 
and then by running baseband in a central location you can make the radios a lot more power efficient uh, and then um, then um, you can do your upgrades a lot more efficiently and and also the the, the spectrum efficiency techniques like uh, coordinated multipoint interference management dynamic spectral sharing there's, there's a lot of functions that are that are standardized and available they can be done a lot more efficiently when you are dealing with a, a, a centralized uh, pool of uh, baseband so that's why not just india but the entire world is going down this path and to facilitate that you need to bring these things closer to closer and that the front the exhaling that gautam talks about is fundamental uh, if you don't have fiber and exhaling then you cannot do baseband pooling so they all uh, tie together sure so the next question is from Yash and he represents uh, ITC. He, uh, the question is, when do we realistically see edge use cases in India? If the timeline is 2022 or 23, the, that, the data centers will have to move towards the edge. How do you see that growth happening in India? Okay, so so edge is just an extension, like we tried to explain earlier on, like edge is just the action, extension of the uh, the core data centers and uh, we think it's going to happen uh, you know in fact one can argue um, as soon as the 5g starts happening edge has to start happening because in order to house baseband pooling you need edge computing right once you have it you might as well use it for other things as well and then a lot of people think that hey for, for edge to happen you need to have gaming and ar vr I th we think edge justification is way more than that so we think it's okay. going to happen lots lot sooner sure sure the next question is uh, so during the presentation uh, you talked about one hop architectures uh, the person asks have you started implementing these in india at scale uh, the answer is yes uh, i think that is uh, very much required we talked about uh, uh, connecting uh, optical networks from uh, let's say different regions and when we create this edge compute uh, regional and edge data centers it's extremely important that uh, we connect it at a predictable latency so uh, we've seen that recent networks in india both uh, we, we simulated and created net pan india networks uh, which actually uh, get into this one hop kind of architecture so answer is yes uh, that we, we started seeing that happening and that that is the way forward is what we feel sure the next question is about the public cloud the person asks do you see telcos moving to public cloud and use features like aws outpost for the edge part maybe i can answer that so uh, in fact we've seen public announcements you all have seen public announcements uh, in the last six months uh, not so much here in india but in the us japan australia uh, very uh, leading operators collaborating with the public cloud vendors in uh, establishing edge uh, rather cloud vendors co-locating their edge solutions in operator locations uh, although it hasn't quite been announced here uh, we believe it's not far off before you see those types of announcements here Sure. The next question is about the fiber cuts. So the person says, and as Gautam mentioned about the frequency of power fiber cuts that we experience, how adaptive uh, adaptive models help? Uh, uh, can can you provide it and and can can self heal networks to support edge? If you could uh, shed some light on that. Yeah. So again. Uh, when you look at the edge, right, it's a very different scenario from the core. And when I mention uh, 15 cuts per thousand kilometers per month, that statistic is more from a core perspective. Uh, in the edge, you see more of uh, 10 to 20 kilometers fiber fibers. So we believe a one plus one ring kind of protection is still uh, good enough from that perspective. Uh, but yes, we will be able to extend capabilities of uh, segment routing and uh, TILFA to actually take care of those scenarios. So yes, uh, resiliency is extremely important. 
but uh, the question is at the edge will we have let's say three or four pairs of fiber to actually do that resiliency and most likely the answer is no we will we'll be only able to have one or two fiber pairs so it's more dependent on the amount of fiber paths that you have or uh, as compared to the technology, the technology can support multiple cuts, yes. Or the technology can be reliable enough to uh, cater to multiple uh, directions and cuts. Sure, sure. The next question is uh, about the CAPEX and OPEX advantages. So the question is, could you please quantify CAPEX and OPEX advantage by adopting, adopting infinite fabric? And secondly, whether it can be deployed in existing Sienna backbone network? Sure, so I'll, I can take that one. And uh, again, as I showed you during the presentation, uh, there are significant uh, CAPEX and OPEX advantages in actually getting into an infinite fabric. Uh, we saw that uh, once you create this fabric below uh, the 75X cost line, which we called it, right? And it's underlying into the photonic layer. Uh, we can save significantly on the amount of modems and ports that we use or expensive electrical resources that we use in a network. So the less amount of electrical resources is also, it also actually uh, translates into less OPEX, the lower lower the power, lower space and lower OPEX, right? So significant advantage on the CAPEX and OPEX side and absolutely, yes, we can deploy it with Sienna gear. Sure. The next question is, uh, uh, you refer to the intent-based networking and how this relates to the overall change in the way networks are being created. If you could shed light, the gentleman mm -hmm. wants to know more, know more about intent-based networking. Okay, maybe I'll take it, maybe Gautam can add. Um, okay, maybe if, if you go back to our original presentation, right? Uh, going forward, we think most of the network functions will be virtualized, either in the form of CNFs or VNFs. And most of the applications, whether they were end use applications or SaaS applications, they're also um, um, in the form of uh, microservices running in containers. And all of these things are orchestrated, developed and deployed and orchestrated by uh, Kubernetes clusters. So that's how we visualize networks going forward. Now, when, when that happens, the underlying connect networks and needs to be um, needs needs to be um, needs to cater for these changing workloads. So, so what we mean by uh, intent-based network is the connect underlay being able to respond to respond to that. We think this will happen in the multiple phases. We think the initial phases we've already started deploying some of that. Initially, it'll be more coarse intent-based networking. When I say coarse internet based meaning it can react to the underlying network can react to latency asks um, or, or bandwidth asks or uh, things like that. Right? It'll be or, or even predefined slices. You know, we can have a bunch of predefined slices depending on the uh, uh, invoking. You can you can select those things. And as um, the technology develops uh, down the track, we will also see more fine grained intent-based networking where you can respond to uh, disjointed parts where you can dis re respond to even some of the requests from workloads so so it's going to be a journey i mean maybe sure. just to add there one of the use cases yeah, yeah sure so one of the use cases here could also be uh, uh, taking a service from the enterprise uh, orchestrating the service through the network and then stretching it into the public cloud so orchestrators have started to actually work together with the public cloud, private cloud, and orchestration is now able to stitch together uh, enterprise services into that cloud. So it's more of it's more driven by intent, and uh, once you need to use that cloud, that stitching can be done on the underlying connect uh, network. Okay, the next question is slightly uh, uh, generic, but is very relevant. Can Indian telecom networks industry or the Indian telecom industry with the $2 ARPU make the investment for the new network 3.0, which you guys have talked about? Is it sustainable, the current uh, landscape in the industry, the financial health of the industry? Do you think that uh, uh, this is in line with the uh, network strategies, idle network strategies? 
Oh, that's a tough one to answer, but, but exactly. we think it is possible. Yeah, I, we think it's possible, right? Because you only uh, you only need, given the huge volumes we have in the country, you only need a, a very minor change in the APUs uh, to make uh, make a big change. Uh, yes, right now, if you look at a percentage of capital investment uh, of revenue is a bit higher compared to compared to the rest of the world. Um, yeah, perhaps we think uh, there's some ARPU increments required, but uh, but by the way, a lot of the things we talked about, it, it, it's already well underway, right? Most of the network functions are virtualized running right now, running on COTS. Um, so a lot of these things are well underway. Perhaps the biggest investment uh, area that uh, that one way to think about is that. Uh, the last mile uh, fiber connectivity uh, that that piece is of course uh, quite uh, resource intensive sure i think uh, we have time for one last question the question is edge data center requires a lot of passive infrastructure so do, so do you think that this will be an economical solution compared to traditional one for our telco in india well, in fact, most of the infrastructure is already in place, right? And if somebody has to go and build these things, I don't think it will become economical, right? You know, operators have hundreds of thousands of these things. Okay, we are not saying that there will be tens of thousands of edges. You know, it could start with a few hundred, then it can grow. But these are the, the, the physical infrastructure, the real estate, the fiber connected, they already exist. Of course, there will be some sure. modifications and power and so on would be required. But the real estate, the most expensive thing is fiber and realistic. The, the real estate they already in place. Right. Any last concluding comments from you since we are ending this uh, session? Look, I think we we are already underway, and in fact, um, given the efficiencies uh that uh, cost efficiencies uh, and the tighter coupling between networking and the cloud that uh, this 3.0 delivers uh it's it's a matter of time uh, before india sees the, this full blown version of 3.0 okay yeah, I think one last anything from you keep, we'll keep yeah, one last comment is uh, we will we'll probably keep innovating on architectures to meet whatever the requirements are, right? So we we've been doing that for for many years, and we'll continue to do that. Sure, I think let's uh, conclude the session on that note. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Gautam, for the session, and thanks for taking all those questions from the viewers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having thanks us. Thanks so much, Anish. Thank you.